Well, this is the last uh, installment on Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed. And this one is about the ingredients necessary for liberty. I think one of the more interesting things about this is Deneen is not a radical. He's not a Marxist by long shot. Um, but he's asking the question, just how free are we? And do we have a good enough democracy? And some of his strongest points come at the end of his book here. In his sixth chapter, he addresses what he calls the new aristocracy. And he reminds us that John Locke, the classical liberal thinker, wished to replace the landed aristocracy of the feudal period with a natural aristocracy, as um, Thomas Jefferson would put it, a natural aristocracy based on intelligence and industriousness. The thought behind this shift was that a supposedly that a rising tide would lift all boats. That is that the industriousness produced by this new liberal regime would help even the poorest among us by generally increasing the standard of living of everybody, even if there was uh, rather stark inequalities. As Locke once put it, um, the idea was that the day laborer in England would be better off than the chieftain in America because the day laborer lived in a system where the economy was expanding. But Deneen points out a couple of problems with with this scenario and with this vision that we've been operating under for quite some time. The first is that the um, excessive growth, um, I know it's difficult to imagine growth being excessive, but our economies have grown in the Western world to the point where many things are produced and sold and consumed that are not at all necessary. And I think maybe the breaking point is harmful to people. And of course he points out, especially harmful to the environment that we all depend upon for life. We have uh, polluted the oceans and, and uh, potentially messed up our, um, the climate that we all depend on for life in order to pursue endless growth. So this is one consequence of the philosophy that a rising tide will lift all boats. And then the other problem is that the so-called natural aristocracy has not been as natural as was envisioned by somebody like Thomas Jefferson, who thought just for once we will have people rising to the top who are... Uh, who get there based on their merit by their natural intelligence and their hard work. But um, over time, that merit-based ideal has been replaced again with what you would expect if you studied history at all, which is that the people who have the most tend to pass that advantage on to the people that they sire. And so success becomes associated with um, successful parentage. Obviously, there isn't a 100% overlap here on either end. Sometimes people who come from very poor backgrounds um, somehow make it big, and sometimes, in fact, more often, people who come from wealthy backgrounds uh, do not. Um, but the odds are in favor of those who come with advantages, who can pass those advantages on to their heirs. And not just in property, but in knowledge, you know. Uh, it's easier to send your kids off to college when you know what college is all about. How to apply for it, how to get scholarships for it, how to prepare for it, how to handle it when you get there. This is knowledge that parents who've gone to college have, and parents who have not gone to college do not have that advantage and can't pass it on to their kids. So the new aristocracy is this new class of pro professional people and uh, the new class of entrepreneurs who have risen to the top, who then pass their ingenuity on to their heirs. But uh, if we look at other people who do not fit that profile, 
he says that they tend to be uh, more and more relegated into the non-professional, non-corporate class. And they are burdened by various things, such as a low wage, he says, quote, low wage and stagnant service industry, uh, where they tend to find their jobs. A lack of access to leadership and citizen education. And that just means that they tend to go to schools where they learn what is necessary to actually perform te technical tasks, but they don't learn uh, from the deep liberal arts tradition, history, uh, culture, political philosophy, um, the things that are needed to actually lead and manage the rest of society. If they're going to have a home, they go into long-term debt to do so, whereas other people with more familial money don't have to do that or don't have to be in debt as long. Or if they don't want an expensive home, they get to spend two to three hours a day commuting back and forth from the suburbs where they can afford a home to the city where they tend to work. So they're burdened with student loan debt from colleges that train them in a sort of vocational way and not in this more elite knowledge necessary to lead. And I don't mean leadership studies. Uh, and they're burdened with mortgage debt also. And so there is an, a sort of intergenerational ec economic stagnation that overcomes the non-elite sector of the economy, meaning that, you know, the professional class uh, passes its advantages on to its heirs, and the non-professional classes also pass on the way their way of life to their heirs. And so there is this bifurcation and a rigidity in the system uh, that you wouldn't expect to have fostered such rigidity. Now, he doesn't just hammer it way, away at this, but he does mention Edmund Burke, the father of classical conservatism. He also mentions Wendell Berry, Christopher Lash. He mentions people who more or less could be identified with the classical conservative position. And the classical conservative position is not the classical liberal position. The classical liberal position is what most American conservatives have latched onto, um, which is the idea of you know private property rights above all, individual self-interest basically runs the world. Um, the Burkean response to that kind of liberalism is the same as Deneen's, and I think he's inspired by this, and he and he actually taps into the Burkean. Uh, way of looking at the world when he asks, where's your freedom? What does your liberty really consist of? I really like this aspect of Deneen's argument. So, you know, some of the questions that Edmund Burke would ask are, you know, what community is backing you up? What community are you enmeshed in whose norms and traditions and habits and ways and expectations uh, and practices back you up and help you and foster uh, your young people uh, and guide people towards a good life and help people when they're down. Where, where is the extended family, which until very recently in human history in the West and even now in many parts of the world to a greater extent, is the number one source of help for people uh, to be able to um, survive, especially when things get tough. Where is your extended family? That means your non-nuclear family, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, your cousins, etc. Do you expect them to come to your aid? Is there any family loyalty there? You may sort of go, well, of course not. I don't even know who some of these people are. That's a very... Uh, unusual situation in human history. Uh, the extended family was a part of your community, a strong part that would help you out and had a responsibility to do so. But even 
Where's your nuclear family? Where's the parents and the children and their relationship in the liberal system, even that is fractured, and even if the family is so-called intact, it may not cooperate together. It may not do something as simple as eat together, let alone um, cooperate in running a household together to make everybody's job easier. Where are your community organizations? Now, churches still exist. Uh, you know, community service organizations still exist. But do they function in any real way to back you up, to support you, uh, to make sure that things get done, to make sure that people are taken care of when they are needed? Yes, they sometimes, uh, you know, raise money to help this or that person out or this or that family out. But there's a difference between doing that and simply coming to the aid when needed as human beings face to face. And I think this is what Deneen is, is finding is missing. What happened to our customs, norms, and habits of friendship, sharing and helping each other, uh, that, that all of these different levels of community used to provide? Well, from Deneen's point of view, liberalism happened with its emphasis on individualism, individual self-interest, autonomy, privacy, and so on. You can have these and also have strong family and strong community at the same time. The one undermines the other. And this is so hard for people to understand because we're taught that strong family and liberal values, meaning American conservative values, go together. Um, I certainly... Uh, believed that for a long time. Of course, the bugbear is the liberal progressives who somehow, you know, are deemed to want to get rid of these values, and some of them are pretty derisive of it. But that does not mean that that the ideology of classical liberalism is a whole lot better in upholding so-called family values and community values. If you really look at how, you know, the, the, uh, the free market um, deals with families and with communities, you see that it also tears them apart, that it creates excuses for people not to be together, to not help each other out, for even husband and wife or spouses to be, you know, separate from each other in the name of, of the career, in the name of the job. And so more and more, we are on our own as individuals without real backup or support. And each person then must replicate everything that is needed to sustain himself, which means, of course, going out and buying it. It's even hard to imagine, but if you think about it, just how much less would you have to spend if you shared with an extended family and a close-knit neighborhood and community around you where you could share the resources that you had. We have come to think of money as the route to inter independence, but interdependence, it, it makes money a lot less necessary for everything. But that level of interdependence is something that we are not used to anymore. Edmund Burke, uh, understood the quality and nature of a thick and strong community. He called it a social fabric of sorts, the social fabric that could be, you know, if, if one pulled too many threads could be unraveled. But it was the very, very support of liberty and independence because through working together and supporting each other and helping each other, people had not only um, the material necessities of life, but they had the emotional support, the very thing of life itself, the emotional support of their fellow community members. He contrasts the point of view of the liberal mill with the classical conservative Burke, and he says, quote, Society today has been organized around the million principle that everything is allowed, at least so long as it does not result in measurable, mainly physical harm. 
It is a society organized for the benefit of the strong, as Mill recognized. By contrast, a Burkean society is organized for the benefit of the ordinary, the majority, who benefit from societal norms that the strong and the ordinary alike are expected to follow. A society can be shaped for the benefit of most people by emphasizing mainly informal norms and customs that secure the path to flourishing for most human beings. Or it can be shaped for the benefit of it, the extraordinary and powerful by liberating all from the constraint of custom. You see there, custom, traditions, ways, habits of a community are there to strengthen most people, to give them backup, to give them structure. Take those things away and the few who are, as he puts it, extraordinary and powerful can much more easily more or less have their way and run roughshod over the rest of society. So the irony is that custom is usually seen by the typical liberal perspective of being um, oppressive, suffocating, not enough about individual freedom, and yet it turns out to be what is necessary in his view to more or less provide the bulwark, the defense against uh, predation against more or less the overwhelming of the many by the few. Then he talks about how the family without the customary supports of family, extended family, neighborhood, community, and so forth, if they are of the upper class, are now supported by the new service sector. So instead of their family and extended family and friends and neighborhood and community providing for things as essential as, you know, caring for your children, uh, household chores, cleaning and lawn services, teachers of our children, uh, those who train our kids to do a variety of things and entertain them a lot of things related to children, are outsourced to people who are doing them for a living um, and whom we can hire. In other words, according to Deneen, an intergenerational servant class has reemerged, uh, sort of replicating the feudal situation with this new twist, an inter intergenerational servant class has reemerged to support the new aristocracy, which is largely formed and maintained by family wealth and elite education. Then he talks a bit in chapter 7 about the degradation of citizenship. He says, The true genius of liberalism was subtly but persistently to shape and educate the citizenry to equate democracy with the ideal of self-made and self-making individuals expressive individualism. While accepting the patina of political democracy shrouding a powerful and distant government whose deeper legitimacy arises from enlarging the opportunities and experience of expressive individualism. But expressive individualism, or being the so-called self-made individual who pulls himself up by his bootstraps, is not the same thing as being a democratic citizen. A democratic citizen is somebody who is fairly deeply involved in the polis, in the, in the democratic community, understands what's going on, and not only that, wants to be a real part of it by taking part in decision-making at a fairly nitty-gritty level. The so-called self-made self individual, or the person with expressive individualism, is somebody who's, spe who's spending far more time in private pursuits, particularly private business pursuits, uh, or in making money, than, than he is in trying to be a democratic citizen, which would require going to meetings, reading the newspaper or whatever, and you know, talking to people and thinking about the common good. 
And what Deneen's going to argue is our entire system was set up to actually discourage that kind of democratic citizenship. It's anti-democratic, and it's, it's actually anti-democratic by design. The American founders were afraid of democracy, the kind of democracy that they learned about in studying ancient Greek democracy. So they put all sorts of mechanisms in place to make sure that democracy didn't get out of hand. So we have separation of powers, checks and balances, right? All of which is probably fairly wise. Uh, but this was put into place because the power of the people was suspect. The commercial republic that Alexander Hamilton wanted emphasized this expressive individualism, the idea of the individual pursuing his private uh, interest and profit. So that was the first and probably the greatest uh, sidestep of the democratic control of ordinary citizens actually um, engaging in citizen activity because as commercial enterprise loomed large, a person uh, thought less and less of uh, deep interest and involvement within the community. And this is the ancient idea of citizenship. But the modern liberal idea of citizenship is maybe voting during election time and paying enough attention to know how to do that. But beyond that, not really uh, paying all that much attention to the common good. And then much later, we have progressive liberals deciding to grow and professionalize the bureaucracy, um, which also took more control away from ordinary citizens to control their government. And then we got a crop of conservative, uh, of the classical liberal, liberal kind, conservative leaders who privatized much of government, and the services that it offered, and this put even more distance between citizens and their government. In other words, citizens had even less control through their vote over what government was capable of doing because of the expansion of the bureaucracy and then the privatization of it. All of this didn't lead to more local and state control, and government has become more and more centralized and remote, even at the same time we believed that it was somehow shrinking. But if you take a good hard look at it, it really hasn't shrunk at all. It's just it's changed how it does things and uh, what types of goals it aims at. So given this, why should we be surprised that we have a citizenry that is apathetic and focused mainly on their private lives? Or that when they vote, the result isn't uh, necessarily reflect their uh personal, rational interests at a certain point. People haven't been trained to be citizens for quite a while, and uh, citizenship hasn't been defined in any meaningful way in quite a while. Well, finally at the end, you know, he circles back to the question of what's going to happen to us because he believes that the liberal state is, is more or less doomed, that it is choking the life right out of itself. Um, which may or may not be accurate, may be too dire of a prediction. But he talks about several scenarios, and I just find, you know, not the scenario so much, but his particular recommendations to be interesting. But he says, you know, one scenario for the future would be that the liberal state doubles down and more or less becomes ever more remote and managerial, but does so gradually and without any sort of major upheaval or revolution. But another scenario would be that re the regime actually changes and uh, it changes towards authoritarian or fascist government. But then there's this third way, which he clearly favors. And the third way is kind of Burkean, um, but uh, even more uh, something else. Um, it is incremental secession, you might say. Uh, a while back in one of my other videos, I mentioned a book by Rod Dreher, uh, The Benedict Option. And it's particularly aimed at Christians and the idea is, well, liberalism is crashing. 
we Christians need to come together and create these monastic communities again so that we can do like people did in the Middle Ages and hopefully hang on to some tradition until, until um, you know, it's time to reemerge, I guess, you know, keep, preserve, preserve these ideals. So when I say Benedict option now, I'm not, though, just referring to the Christian uh, rendition of this, but more generally the option of seceding from the larger community, but seceding within it. It seems to be something that people are talking about more and more. Deneen says that in order to make this actually positive, we need to do three things. First of all, not to wish to go back uh, before liberalism, because after all, liberalism has given us some very good things. Uh, in his view, those things would be things like uh, basic gender and uh, racial equality, for instance. The ideal of freedom of speech, freedom of worship, those things are good in his view. So we have to move forward and take those good things uh, with us and not be wedded to the bad things, but certainly not to go back to an illiberal past, which could be worse. Uh, so secondly, and to the point, he says, we need to reject ideology. We need to get past ideology, not create a new one or not go back to an old one. I've talked a lot on this channel about you know, ideology as religion. And I think he's getting at that notion that we need to stop treating ideology as if it's some sort of religion that people have to believe in. And we need to start coming up with, you know, practical solutions to our problems. Which leads to the third point, which is that we need to construct a practical, what I would call neo burkean theory of social order. He says, quote, it means offering actual human liberty in the form of both civic and individual self-rule, not the ersatz version that combines systemic powerlessness with the illusion of autonomy in the form of consumerist and sexual license. Now, don't miss that. He's saying human liberty consists in civic and individual self-rule. We can't be free unless we actually can affect change and influence our politics around us. In fact, particularly close to us, what's going on in our immediate environment, environment and then beyond. And even more fundamentally, we cannot be free unless we rule ourselves. And that's what those customs and traditions and habits of community used to be able to help us with. Family, extended family, community, um, habits, customs, rules, traditions, they all helped people to have self-rule, rule of self, uh, to not be slaves to either one's passions or to the trends and fads of a larger community without self-control, is why he mentions consumerism and sexual license. So he's making the classic distinction here between license and liberty. License being doing whatever the hell you want to do, whenever you want to do it without thinking about it, and liberty being ordered, uh, self-control, enough prudence to be able to do what is actually good for one's well-being. And I just love this quote, so I'm going to read it. Uh, it it's a lot of food for thought here. Um, but he talks about, uh, uh, you know, the need for countercultures. Now, counterculture is a term that emerged even in the 60s and tends to evoke, uh, you know, images of hippies with their, I don't know, whatever. Their, <laughs> yeah. Whatever, but he, anyway, he says, for a time, such practices will be developed within intentional communities that will benefit from the openness of liberal society. They will be regarded as options within the liberal frame, and while suspect in the broader culture, largely permitted to exist so long as they are non-threatening to the liberal order's main business. 
Yet it is likely from the lessons learned within these communities that a viable post-liberal political theory will arise, one that begins with fundamentally different anthropological assumptions, not arising from a supposed state of nature or concluding with a world-straddling state and market, but instead building on the fact of human relationality, sociability, and the learned ability to sacrifice one's narrow personal interest not to abstract humanity, but for the sake of other humans. I love that. I love that. Basically there, I'm getting that um, as people start to create their version of the Benedict Option, when they start to try to create or recreate strong communities, whether just in their family, their extended family, neighborhood, friendship circles, communities, where people really do rely on each other and expect help from each other and accept burdens from each other, they will be able to do so within the so-called liberal frame. Um, piecemeal, in various ways, various times, uh, not one way, not based on some overarching ideology, but people will, he hopes, take back community for themselves and strengthen themselves and give themselves the liberty that they are missing. This is really quite radical and it's really, really hella traditional and old at the same time. That's what people have been doing for literally thousands of years up until just the last few generations. It's not crazy. It's what my parents used to do, or maybe especially their parents. Post-World War I, there's less and less of it, but it's within their memory, and it's not some crazy radical idea. People are very capable of creating this kind of community. So Deneen leaves us with thoughts like that. Um, I hope that you found this minimal coverage of this book uh, helpful. I highly recommend you buy this book. It's worth it. Uh, learn the argument and get into this uh, way of thinking so that you can kind of, even if you don't agree with it, I think it's very mind expanding and it kind of helps you to think about our future. All right. That's it. Thanks. Bye.